Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Open your Bibles, Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. The title of our message is Learning to No Longer Hope in Man. I want you to consider in your own life how often you trust man. You trust the word of a man or a woman. You, you hold on to that to the degree where you trust in the hope and you trust in hope in man to a greater degree than you trust in God. Where if someone makes you a promise and it encourages you, but then God makes promise after promise and you wonder if he's gonna come through. Where you're gonna trust the guy to keep his promise in your life, but there are those seasons where you don't even trust God when he's made a promise where he desires to work on our behalf. Joseph is learning this. He's learning it in a very painful way to no longer hope in man. And it's a hard season we drop into Joseph's life here. It's a hard season of his life, pain upon pain. And in the midst of pain, God is showing favor. Notice back in chapter 39, verse 21. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph. And this is the secret to his success. It's not a secret, it's made here very publicly that the Lord was with Joseph. And he showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Things are looking up in this difficult time in Joseph's life. He's receiving favor and God's blessing. Not only that, he was given more responsibility in verse 22 of 39. The keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever they did there, it was his doing. And the keeper of the prison didn't even look into anything that was under Joseph's hand. Because the Lord was with him. And if you haven't already written in your Bibles, circle that phrase in verse 21, circle that phrase in verse 23, and make sure you circle that phrase in your life. This is the key and the secret to your success. Anything good in your life is because the Lord is with you. As a believer, the Lord is with you. Even as an unbeliever, the favor of God is because God is with you. He, it's his grace. He deserves all the credit. Even to those that are rebellious and angry and even what you would call God haters, you are alive and able to hate God because God is loving and merciful towards you. It wouldn't be possible otherwise. He has given you life and is patient with you. With Joseph, just when things begin to look up, the bottom falls out again. That's the pattern of his life. Just when you think he's making progress, the Lord is with you, Joe. The Lord is with you. Look what, even this difficult situation, God has shown you favor. And it says in verse one of chapter 40, it came to pass after these things. I remind you from time to time that these are the kind of phrases that we read over. We just read over because it's an introductory sentence to a new paragraph or in this case, to a new chapter, it was after these things. It came to pass after these things. And I want to teach you as a, as a pastor and as a Bible student to not skip these phrases, especially when you have a couple, you have some extra time in the word where you can just pause for a second and just ask the question, what things? What things? What things is the Bible referring to? And the way to answer that question is to answer it in context. We just did that already in chapter 39. You look to what came before, what's happening before. What's happening before? Joseph is receiving favor from the Lord. Joseph is experiencing the presence of God. He's enjoying it. As hard as the situation is, God is with him. And it was in these times of great progress that come great warfare, great difficulty, great challenges. Joseph provides for us an example of faith in God in situations that we can't see how it's going to turn out. We're living in the favor of God, but it's after these things it came to pass. It's in the midst of these things it came to pass. You see, in Joseph's life, we have the 
opportunity and the privilege of seeing what God is doing. He's giving us insight of what God is doing behind the scenes. But like Joseph, you and I don't know what's happening behind the scenes in our lives. Joseph encourages us because it tells us God is doing something behind the scenes. Well, I don't know what he's doing in my life behind the scenes yet. In God's timing and providence, he's going to reveal it to me, but I don't know yet. Things might be looking up for me. Then there might be some warfare, but there might be something so much more bigger. It's not might be. There is something so much bigger that I don't quite see yet. I see right now, the Bible says, in a mirror dimly. I don't have the full picture. It's not crystal clear. I see a little bit up ahead. But with Joseph, we learn nothing just so happens because God knows what's happening. He understands. These things in Joseph's life are training him. And the things in your life are training you and preparing you like he was preparing Joseph and equipping you like he was equipping Joseph. And if anyone had the right to question God or you know, look like they had the right to question God of the difficulties they face, I think it would have been Joseph. But he doesn't. He humbly submits to his life as bad as it was in the moment. He lived a submitted life, a surrendered life. In the preparation time, God doesn't... See, Joseph doesn't even know what God's preparing him for. <laughs> he doesn't have any clue. From any standpoint, you know, if you're living Joseph's life and being in it, from any standpoint, you're like, man, this is what it is. I better be a good prisoner. I don't even deserve to be here. I better be a good prisoner because this is where I'm at. I'm not going to be able to undo what, what happened before me. But here in this time, it says in verse 1, it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with these two officers and the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put him in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. This prison experience in Joseph's life is going to teach him how to care. It's going to develop in him a caring heart. It's going to teach him how to sense needs. It's going to give him a sensitivity to others' needs. He's going to learn in this prison experience in chapter 40 how to trust God. He's going to learn how to walk in humility and to stand in courage. And finally, he's going to learn how not to trust in man. Or as I phrased it, learning to no longer hope in man, but to put your trust in the Lord. Now, the butler and the baker come into prison, but don't get in your mind this idea of a traditional butler who comes in with a plate and a thing over his arm and he's got a tuxedo on. This would have been a man that was very influential, place of trust and dependence, somebody super close to Pharaoh, highly trusted, we don't know exactly the responsibilities of the butler, uh, but the baker, we know, would be in charge of his food. He would be in charge of what would be provided. There were some commentators that speculated that the issue that offended uh, Pharaoh was that somehow poison was found. It wasn't found close to his lips, but it was found close to him. And the uh, charge for that was be thrown in prison, but we don't know for sure. And where is Joseph? Joseph has been, listen, Joseph has been pre-positioned to meet this butler and baker. Pre-positioned. God knew all this unfolding. Joseph's learning it a little at a time. And it says in verse four, when the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, not only was he pre-positioned, but he was placed in the position to oversee these men. God is setting this up. He served them, it says, verse 4. And so they were in custody for a while. Joseph's in charge, but he serves them. Don't miss that. You might want to mark that. He's in charge. He's in a place of authority, but he chooses to serve them. This is a place of learning how to care for others, even while he himself is suffering great hardship. I know at times suffering and pain and trials can stop a person from serving the Lord. Sometimes it's of necessity for a season. You're incapable. 
and you're healing and you're, you're having to process this new reality and for a season. However, it's also possible that you can hurt and serve at the same time. It's a healthy place to be. You can hurt and serve others at the same time. It needs to be said, and it also needs to be learned, that others, they are waiting for someone like you to serve them. Even though you're in a tough spot, in a difficult spot. You understand now the the warning in the New Testament about not allowing bitterness to take root in your heart. (laughs) Because bitterness is a defiling agent. It's not a helpful. It's not helpful to you, and it's not helpful to the people around you. It's defiling. It's dirtying. It, it, it diminishes the holiness and the mercy and the grace and the character of God through your life. It would be easy if you're thrown into prison, falsely accused, to become bitter and to be upset about it the rest of your life. And that becomes your new identity. I don't belong here. I don't belong here. I don't belong here. I don't belong here. And you say that a million times, you begin to live out that reality. Except that you can, ex- you, you can come to terms with the reality you don't belong there and then turn it around and go, but God has me here. And that's a turning point. Even in great hardship, Joseph is serving them. Now I've noticed over the years when it relates to servanthood, especially here in a church where we value servanthood, that the pastor, it starts with me, I'm to be the chief servant of this church. This is not like the world where you climb the ladder and the higher you get, the less work you do. That's not the way of the world. The way that, I mean, that's the way of the world. It's not the way of the church. The way of the church is the ladder is down. And the more you, the more responsibility you have, the more service you do. I mean, if you're climbing the ladder in the church, that means you want to serve more, not less. And the pastor is to be the chief servant. And those serving in leadership are to be co-laborers in that service. But here's what I've seen over the years. And if you are serving in this church, I want to warn you about it so you know ahead of time. I have noticed over the years that positions and titles can ruin a person. They just take a person out. Where there is this sense of starting out well and I want to serve the Lord and just tell me what to do and here I am, brother, I'll be at every service and I'll just do whatever you call. But, but there is this ulterior motive, spoken or unspoken, that the more I serve, the more I'll be noticed and the more I'm noticed, the more authority I'll be given and the more authority I can be given, then I can tell other people to serve. And when titles get thrown around, I mean, you have folks that tend to serve, serve and work hard, but once they're getting in a place of authority, that expectation now is no longer serving, but now there's a new expectation. Well, don't you know who I am? I'm like, yeah, bro, you're my brother in the Lord. No, 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 I'm much more than your brother. And, and you change your voice and all that, you know. In the world, I, I experienced this. I don't know if you have, but it's very, I, I remember watching this multiple times where you would be working and in the position I had, I was a dispatcher. So I had a lot of people working side by side. We're all working together, all doing the same job, all supporting one another, man, making it work. Teamwork makes the dream work. All of that, man, that was it. But then along the way, so-and-so didn't show up anymore. They didn't show up in the chair next to you. They showed up at the office with a new polo shirt. That's what they had. They weren't wearing what we used to wear, T-shirts. Now they've got the polo with the collar and a little name badge. They had to be a really long name badge because they were assistant, 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 core sort of, kind of, junior supervisor. Woo! Don't you know who I am? Yeah, bro, you were sitting next to me yesterday and I helped you do your job when you didn't know how to do it. I know who you are. Oh, no, I am your boss. I'm like, bro, you're a junior, junior, junior supervisor that doesn't know how to do that job. What makes me think you know how to do it? That's your inside voice. Your outside voice is, yes, you are my boss now, you know. <laughs> because titles, they just have a way of, if you don't know. God, so what happens when in the church? You know what happens in the church? There are titles. There are recognition in the sense of what level of service and responsibility you have. But you know what God, how God gives titles? He prepares you for them. <laughs> he prepares you. You know how he prepares you? through challenges and difficulties. He gets you ready for him. He wants you ready for him. He wants you to serve well. 
He wants you to love him and love people. He doesn't want a title to ruin you. He doesn't want to see you in a position of authority like Joseph here, and then once you have authority, you start lording over people. So much so that God says, you know what? Don't lord over people. The Bible says that straight up. That is not God's will for anyone in authority to throw titles. As a matter of fact, you know this as well as I do, but when someone has to throw their title around to get you to do something, they're not leading you and they're not serving you. They're bossing you. And you know, you don't respond too well to bosses. You love working for people that serve you and work alongside of you and try to make your life better and create an environment so you can be successful because they realize if you're successful, they're successful and we're successful. That's a beautiful thing. Man, I don't know how many of you, but I've certainly worked for a few where guys like, like, I know you're my boss. You don't need to tell me every day. I know. I know you're my boss. You don't, you don't need to let everybody know. We all know. So why don't you just do your job? I'll do mine. You do yours. And in the church, the way that looks in the church is, hey, look, church, just do your job. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't matter what role and what title. Don't let titles, here's my point, don't let titles ruin you. Because if a title ruins you, a lot of people are going to get hurt. People that are looking to you. People that are hurting. People that now the chief butler and the baker were in a place of great esteem. Now they're experiencing what Joseph's experiencing. In the same place. I reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, you know, the Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he says that God is the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation. Why? So that we might be able to comfort others that are going through the same thing. Here they are going through the same thing that Joseph is going through and he's ready to serve them. Mark, Mark chapter 10, if you want to jot it down in verse 45, it says, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And Joseph here is serving. I think his service came from a deep place of faith in God's will for his life. We often equate God's will for our lives as only the best things that happen to us, but everything that comes to us has been father filtered. The pain, the difficulty, this, these are times when we're falsely accused, when we're slandered, gossip, whatever. These are times, these difficulties, where the devil sees an open door and he comes and whispers or screams at you, where's your God now? Is this how God rewards you? Joseph, coat of many colors, dad's favorite. Is this how God rewards faithfulness and faith? Throwing you into prison, putting you in a place of great distress. If those were around Joseph, maybe his brothers could say the same thing. Oh, I thought your God was faithful. I thought your God cared. I thought, and look at you. I mean, you're going through things. And you can hear the unbeliever at work, can't you? You're going, things, going through things that are worse than I've ever experienced. That's your God. And they become mockers. But through his service, listen, through his service, Joseph was saying, my God hasn't changed. He's with me right here, right now. And I'm going to take this opportunity to serve him even in this prison. He hasn't changed. In verse five, again, it says, then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison dreamed a dream. Both of them, each man's dream in one night and each man's dream with its own interpretation. Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officer who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house saying, why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, we each have a dream to dream and there's no interpreter of it. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. Another characteristic of Joseph here in the midst of his distress is Joseph's in a very difficult situation himself, but he still notices sadness and sorrow around him. He has, he cares, and because he cares, he observes, 
And because he cares and observes, he sees that they're troubled. And when he sees that they're troubled, he asks them how they're doing, what's wrong? And it reminded me of Nehemiah. Nehemiah did the same thing. When the messenger came to him and he asked them, hey, what's going on? He asked them knowing that the answer could have moved him to some action. And he asked the question, what's going on in Jerusalem? Why? Because he cared. But I I see a connection here in Joseph's life, in Nehemiah's life, of this asking. Because here's the thing. A lot of times, people are avoided and questions are avoided simply because you know if you ask the question, there's going to be some answer that you're going to have to deal with. And you don't want to deal with it. And so as a Christian, you avoid certain people. And if somebody does come up, you, you feel prompted by the spirits. Are you okay today? You go, I don't really want to ask that right now because I already know they're not okay and I don't want to deal with it. And friend, I think that's sin. I don't think that's okay. You, you, don't, have, you don't have the choice to choose who comes to prison with you, man. If the butler and the baker show up to prison, you need to ask them how they're doing. If somebody shows up into your life or you find out you bump into somebody, you gotta, you gotta care enough to observe, to ask, and then you, you know what? Tell me, go ahead and tell me. I know, God, I know a God that interprets dreams, so just tell me what's going on. Give me the dreams. I mean, Joseph doesn't even really know what he's gonna do with the information yet, but he's willing to do it. I was sharing with our team today and our staff devos and, and our discipleship time that I believe, and, and I believe this with all my heart, I believe it's always been the same, but we're alive now, that the changing force on the earth today in the culture environment, the political environment, the economic environment, the changing power, the force that will make progress and move the church forward in the world today is the agape love of God. It is otherworldly, supernatural, unexplainable. Not the kind of love that we can build up, like we can pretend to care. That's not what I'm talking about. And we can partly care. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the self-sacrificial love that's displayed by God the Father, where the Bible says that he so loved this sin-reject, God-rejecting world. He so loved that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The kind of agape love that cares steps into lives. The kind of agape love at great personal sacrifice, time, talents, treasures, that would step into someone's life and make yourself available, not for your name, not for a church's name, but for the name of Jesus Christ on the earth today. You can't argue with the agape love. You can't explain it. People get mad at it. People don't know, they don't know how, they don't know how to explain the kind of love that God flows through his church. And there is no other, no other people, no other people group, no other entity, no other organization that displays the agape love. None, it's only the church. Only the church can walk in the agape love that, let me show you, give you a a real peek of it. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Because long before 1 Corinthians 13 is written, Joseph's walking in this agape love. He's in charge. He's the head of the prison. He doesn't need to do anything for these guys. He can just say, yeah, you over, go over there and be chained to the wall or whatever. I don't know how it was. it was. I'm sure it was a horrible experience, but he's already living this out before it was ever written. Why? Because the spirit of God is ministering in Joseph's life. He, he's, he, is, he is living in Joseph's life and you have a greater relationship with the Holy Spirit than Joseph ever had. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where we pick up in the description in verse four. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And this is Joseph's life here. He cares. And I love to see that in our church. I love to hear that in our church. I love to hear the testimonies of God using you in people's lives. For no other reason, no other reason than you care. And you care enough to observe. 
And in your observations, the Holy Spirit says, here, move, act, love, care, serve, speak, invite them into your life. Sometimes you need to carefully invite yourselves in their lives and be open to be used of God. I know we use words and phrases and we have vision statements and axiom statements. We have all this information to help define us. But I mean, really, think about it. When disciple and send are words of love to take the church. And I was talking to someone today about this. It just seems like the church is so scared by what's everything's happening in the world that they've taken on, and, and maybe you have, and I just let the, just pray about this, but you're just taking this isolationist view toward the world, like just protect everything and make sure we all protect. And we just, like the world needs you. And then the world doesn't need you hiding in a cave somewhere like Elijah. The world doesn't need you up, you know, hiding butter and guns. I don't know why butter, but butter and guns and food and, you know, as much toilet paper as you can get from Costco. So when the end of the world comes, you, like, the world needs you right where you are, caring, observing, and helping in Jesus' name. That's how you were reached. Many of us were reached because somebody cared enough to call us, reach out to us, not give up on us invite us to church, give us a book. Back in the day, give us a tape, a cassette tape. Listen to this. Why would I listen to that? What kind of music is, oh, it's not music. It's a guy teaching the Bible. What? You could take your cassette tape back, bro. I don't need that. But what did I need? I needed to hear the love of God through the gifting of a pastor teacher, teaching the word where, man, he cared enough. So care, because here they are. They have dreams. They're already troubled. Now they're troubled by dreams. They don't know what their future is. Joseph steps in. I love this, verse nine now. The chief butler told him his dream and said, behold, in my dream, a vine was before me. And in the vine, there were three branches. It was as though it budded. It blossomed, shot forth. Its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. And within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to the place, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But remember me when it is well with you, and please show me kindness to me Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house, for indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here that they should put me in to the dungeon. The dream is a beautiful one, the interpretation is beautiful, and you have to step back and go, wait a minute, why would God bring, why would God bring the butler into prison next to Joseph? have a troubled face, match up with Joseph's caring, to hear the dream. God gives him the instant interpretation. Why would God all do this? To get these words out of Joseph's mouth. You ready? Just mark them. But remember me when it's well with you. All this is going on just to get Joseph to mouth a really deep desire in his heart. What was that desire? He wants out of prison. Doesn't surprise you, does it? I said, I would too. He's faithful. He's embracing his life. He's serving. He's caring. He's observing. He's stepping into life. All of the characteristics that you would expect from a man that loves God. And he wants to get the heck out of prison. All this is being arranged, in this case, to get these words out of his mouth. Just remember me, bro. Where there's a sense now, by saying that to the butler where Joseph's heart wakes up every day. I wonder if today is the day when the butler remembers me. Not, I wonder if today is the day God remembers me. But I wonder if the butler remembers, because the butler's here and he's going to be with Pharaoh. And I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. Notice the next dream. Verse 16, when the chief baker saw the interpretation was good, he's like, I also had a dream. And in it were three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket, there were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. The birds ate them out of the basket on my head. So Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. And the baker's going, yes, 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 yes. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree. No, no, no. Go back, go back. And the birds will eat your flesh from you. And now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast 
for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. He restored to the chief butler to his butlership again, placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Why the baker dream? Why the interpretation? It wasn't to get the words, but remember me out of his mouth. For the baker, God allowed all these circumstances for Joseph to reveal a depth of courage to speak the truth. This would have been very, very hard to share. I wonder if Joseph was thinking, I wonder what great, oh, it's going to be great. Just the interpretation is going to be just like the butler. But it wasn't. It was a very hard word to share. Again, God preparing Joseph for the future. God preparing Joseph for the future, being able to speak the truth, being able to tell the truth. Remember in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse six, I'll read to you in the New Living Translation, it says, wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses of the enemy. The Bible says that we're to speak the truth in love. We're to be honest with one another. Truthfulness is a sign of closeness to the Lord. A person willing to cling to the truth no matter the consequence is a man or a woman of maturity and growing maturity. In Psalm 86, verse 11, it says, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Truth is a mark of the believer. Truth is a mark of a follower of Christ. In Psalm 119, verse 30, it says, I have chosen the way of truth. And I commend you, church. I I encourage you in the decisions and the things in your life right now, choose the way of truth. No deception, no pretending, no partial truths. A partial truth is a lie. Choose truth, choose honesty. Let it be the mark of Christ in and through you. Well, we read in verse 20 that the interpretations come through. True, uh, Pharaoh has a major birthday party. It was customary. He lifts up both these men. He restores the butler. He has the baker hang just as God revealed to Joseph. Why? Because God always keeps his word. He always keeps his word. The word of the Lord, you can count on it. My word, I would hope you can count on it, but not 100% because I'm not a perfect man. But the word of God, you can count on 100%. God never lies, no variation, no shadow of turning. You can trust the Bible. You can trust it implicitly. You can trust it explicitly. You can trust it 100% of the time. The word of man, not so much. In Joshua chapter 21, verse 45, listen, it says, not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Isn't that great? That's going to be said over your life one day. It's true of your life right now. There's not a word of God that has failed, failed you in your life. Not one. Even if circumstances make it look that way, I'm telling you, Joseph is experiencing the faithfulness of God even in prison. Not only that, Psalm 138 verse 2, it says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. Listen, this is what the Bible says. God has magnified his word above his name. That's how important God's word is. You've magnified your word above all your names. Second Peter ver- chapter 1, verse 19, that we have the prophetic word confirmed. You can trust the word of God. Yet, you can't always trust man. Your trust always has to be in the Lord. Notice in Joseph's life again, everything came to pass that God said, but the butler did not remember Joseph, verse 23, but forgot him. It doesn't even have to be like negative motives. It could be he's all excited. It could be that he's excited to be restored and he's alive and he's getting on with life and he forgot Joseph. Joseph wasn't a part of his life for very long and he forgot him. And when you put yourself in Joseph's place for a moment, here he is telling the truth, telling the butler the good news and all that he asked was that the butler mentioned him to Pharaoh But when the butler was released, he forgot him. Joseph was probably excited the first few days after he heard, got word that 
The dreams that he interpreted were accurate 100%. And I'm sure he got excited. Okay, now the butler, now the butler's gonna remember, I'm out any day, I'm out any day, I'm out any day. I am out any day, I'm, I'm out any, any day now, any week now, any month now, any year now. He was forgotten. But God, he hasn't forgotten Joseph. The butler did, but God didn't. And this is a serious lesson. I want to show it to you. Turn over to Psalm chapter 20 with me. This is one of the things specifically that Joseph is learning. This is why it's so important, friends, to be in the Bible every day, reading it, praying every day is with an open Bible, because you may come across, it may be the appointed time for you to come across the scripture that reveals the lesson that you're learning, where you finally get clarity or you get a deeper understanding. You stumble across a passage and you're like, man, that's me. Thank you, Lord, for that revelation. The revelation won't come if you're not in the word. The revelation won't come. It won't have confirmation if you're not in prayer with the Lord. And I don't just mean sitting down at the table with a cup of coffee. I mean, man, being in prayer, being in relationship, being in a communication, long prayers, short prayers, loud prayers, soft prayers, prayers in your mind, prayers when you don't know, desperation, comfort, surrender. Listen to what he's, listen, notice what he's learning here in Psalm 20 in verse six, Psalm 20, verse six. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the Saving strength of his right hand. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Some trust in chariots, verse 7, and some in horses, and some in butlers. You could add that. I mean, don't add to the word, but you could put that there. Some trust in chariots and horses and butlers. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. It's foolish to trust in butlers, as trustworthy as butlers might be. We need to learn to trust in the Lord, no matter what comes our way. And God knows that we need to trust him. And listen, some of you won't like this because it's the answer to the problem in your life. You're not gonna like it, so be prepared. God allowed the butler to forget Joseph. God allowed it. In that silence, Joseph was brought to a place of decision once again in the prison. Falsely accused in Potiphar's house. Sold as a slave. Thrown in a pit for dead. It was in that silence that Joseph needed to decide once again, will I walk away from the Lord or will I press in? Is this the one that I'm giving up now? After all, I've got this series of disappointments and offenses I have with God and I've got through them and the Lord's helped me, but now I got another one. And it was in that silence that he needed to press into the Lord. It would be another two years in this hell hole of a prison, living with the pain and injustice. But not only that, Joseph was learning not to trust in man. I am not advocating, please don't misunderstand me, that we don't have trust relationships with each other. Of course we do. The deeper the trust, the deeper the relationship. That's not what I'm referring to. Every real relationship is built on trust. What I'm saying here and what I'm seeing in Joseph's life and what I'm learning in my life that my hope and my trust cannot be in man, it must be in God. That my primary trust relationship is with God. Again, let me give to you in Psalm 118, verse eight. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. I mean, we could, do, we could do a Bible study just on this. It's, it's better to trust in God. It's better than trusting in man. 
And even princes who have authority and have money and have resources, it is better to trust in God than in to trust in men. Because there is the temptation and the possibility that if the butler did remember him and did tell Pharaoh, that the butler would receive all the glory for the work that God did. It's a possibility. And like Joseph, we need to learn this lesson. You're, some of you are learning it right now. You want to jump out of your chair. That's me. That's me. And the Lord is still faithful to you. <laughs> this is a source of much disappointment in our lives. We choose to trust a man, a woman, someone you would expect that we can trust, and they let us down. And you add to that your everyday issues. You add to that your unmet expectations, and we're offended, and we're frustrated, and we're angered, and the enemy loves to divide us from each other and from God through offenses. And it's just better to trust in the Lord because he'll never let you down. And Joseph's waiting and praying and hoping and he refused to give up on God. He refused to throw in. It it, it says in verse one, it came to pass of chapter 41 at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream and behold, he stood by a river. Whoa, wait a minute. Pharaoh had a dream? Interesting. And you can read ahead. We'll get to it in our next study, but you can read ahead. Dreams connected with other dreams. Oh, there's a guy. There's a guy that can speak forth interpretation of dreams and now Joseph's connected with Pharaoh imagine that the kid thrown into the pit is going to stand before Pharaoh the leader of the known world you just never know how God is going to where he's going to place you who he's going to place you in front of you just need to be ready just be ready God's plan is awesome for your life gang God's plan brings forth life and joy and relationships and brings families together and people together and binds us together. So Lord, we we ask, teach us to wait. Church, don't panic in this situation. Don't give up too early. You know, I know we complain because we don't see the end. That's our, we don't, we complain and we murmur and we don't like it because we don't see the end. We don't see that God is working. We don't remember that he is good and that he loves me. And these are two foundational truths that you must cling to. Two foundational truths that you must cling to. Number one, I know that God is good. And number two, I know that God is love. And if you hang on to those two things, it'll get you through anything. I know that God is good. I don't feel it right now. I don't see it right now, but I know it. All things are working for good. He loves me. Because without Christ, without, you're without hope, you know? Without Christ, without God in this world, it's a most miserable place to be. There's no meaning, no rhyme or reason to anything when you don't have a, con- a relationship with the living God. But to receive Jesus is to have peace with God. And then that peace begins to rule in your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. And that what, that's what makes the Christian different. That's what opens us for the agape love of God because we trust God. It's an attitude. It's an acceptance. And we thank God even for that. And we learn not to trust in man and put our hope in man, but to trust in the Lord. Listen, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And it's better to trust in the Lord to put confidence in princes. Amen? Lord, we admit to you the truth of your word and we pray it into our hearts tonight. We don't want to live like we don't have any hope. We don't want to live to a watching world like we think you're not in control and you're not sovereign you're not on the throne and you don't know what you're doing. We don't want to cave to the mocking words of the world or the mocking words of friends or the mocking words of TikTok or the mocking words of YouTube, or the mocking words of Twitter, or Instagram, or Facebook, or that email, that letter, the mocking words of the devil, our own flesh shaming, living under shame and guilt and condemnation, God. We ask for a fresh wind of your presence to be felt in here today. Forgive us for trusting man. Forgive us for looking to man as the solution to the problem that's before us. Forgive us, God, as a church for 
wanting to solve spiritual problems with human-centered solutions. And teach us, God, not to put our hope in man, but to put our hope in you, God, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before you endured the cross, despising the shame, and you've sat down at the right hand of the Father in a place of finality and rest, of authority and rest. And as we're praying tonight, if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus or you're there listening to me from afar, I invite you to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior today. That you would know that you that you know that eternity is yours in God, like he loves you and has given his son to forgive you of your sins. And so if you're here in the room, I want to give you a chance. If that's you, you say, Ed, I need, to, I need to follow God with my life. I want to give my life to Christ tonight. Would you just stand to your feet? I want to pray with you that today would be the day that you finalize that decision now in this moment. That you say, here I am, God. Take my life. It belongs to you. I receive the forgiveness of my sins. And it's true. Every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of the perfection of God, the glory of God, the holiness of God. And yet still he invites us into relationship. He doesn't despise us or throw us away or ignore us or give us the silent treatment. God invites us to himself. Anyone here want to give you that opportunity before we leave? Like there's no need for you to keep living your own way. There's no need for you to leave here the same or actually worse than when you first came in. Because now, once again, another time you reject Christ. It's like, you know, whenever I say that, people are always like, I didn't reject Christ. Well, Jesus did. He said it this way. If you're not for him, you're against him. And it's a call to commitment. Perhaps you're watching online right now and, you know, maybe listening on the radio and and God's giving you that same invitation. You could be even downstairs uh, in the cafe down there at the res or in the overflow. And the Lord knows because he loves you. He's got your attention and he wants you to follow him. That's his word to you today, to follow him. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Why? Because with the heart one believes to righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You can just ask God, God, forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you with my life. And he'll hear that prayer. You can go to our website, calvaryco.church, and there's a tab up there that says how to know God. How to know God. And all the information we have here at the church is available online. All the discipleship info, all the questions answered, what it means to follow Jesus. Of course, you guys that are here, we can give it to you before you leave. But the Lord is working in your life. He's getting your attention like Joseph. I don't want you to miss that. I want you to understand that, grasp that. Father, I I pray for the reality of your presence among us and the battle for the souls of women and men, girls and boys. I can always remember my Wednesday nights walking into a church and not wanting to be there listening to Bible study and not really understanding any of it. But all the while, you're drawing me to yourself. I know you're doing that work among us, even on a Wednesday night. Have your way with us, God. Grow us and strengthen us that you might be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.